I'd like to, to interject one of the most useful tools, and I think every fixer should have one of these. It's what's called a non-contact uh, a non-contact voltmeter, basically. Um, if you if you have a, a product and you're not sure if the power is is getting to a certain point, you can use these things. And I don't know if you can see that. If, when the red light comes on, it means that that wire is live. You don't even have to contact it with metal to metal. You just hold it near there and if it turns red, it's on. If, and you can even tell which side of a line cord is connected to the hot and which side is connected to the neutral with it. Um, it's, it's, it's more useful. I, I, I find it for, for repairing you know, AC products. It's almost more useful than a, than a, a, a multimeter, although it's for different things, at least for checking the presence. Yeah, you got one too. Yeah. Um, that's that one, Let's, I believe, yeah, that one uh, can also sense lower voltage than, uh, yeah. if I remember and it, correctly. You yeah. can bring it up to a, uh, a, a yeah. uh, cell phone wire and detect whether there's current going through it. And it's got the beep mode, so it, it's not, you don't have to look at anything. You could just listen. Yep. It's, it's very good. I use it all the time. It's got a pocket clip because you're going to want to use it a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it's not expensive. I, I forget where I got it, but I got it online. It was like 20 bucks. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of course, the second most useful tool is probably a multimeter because you can check continuity with that. I, I use a, a nice fluke one, but you can get these for about six bucks at, uh, at Harbor Freight. <laughs> and uh, they, they do a pretty good job. I mean, you know, they, they may not be accurate, but you don't need accurate, you know, ult ultimate accuracy to do repairs. You just need to be safe. You need to be able to tell if there's voltage on that at that point in the circuit without having to, you know, get your, your, your hands too close to it. Some um, of the multimeters also have the non-contact mode. So if you, you can put it near a wire, it's the same thing as this widget here, except it's built into the multimeter. Yeah, that's a, that's a good feature. Um, if I may, um, one thing that I'd like to interject is kind of uh, an overview also of the levels of electrical, both electrical safety, but also electrical repair that I usually see. Um, because the thing is that usually um, when you get to electrical repair, there's kind of a hierarchy of the types of repairs that you'll wind up seeing, that, at least in my experience. And Please correct me if you guys are seeing something different, but um, you'll oftentimes see relatively simple repairs that require you to either reconnect a wire or do something at kind of the bulk sort of level where you're dealing with wiring, you're dealing with power just getting in. Then kind of a level down from that is when you have an assembly level uh, repair that you need to do where you're basically swapping out a component whether it be like a switch cartridge on a power cable or something of that nature. And then a step down from that or kind of a step aside from that is when you have a sub-assembly within the uh, device itself. Like, for example, if I have a motor that I need to replace inside of a blender and the, the um, person comes in with a new motor, then that's kind of the parts level replacement. And then when we get all the way down to the fine stuff, then we're doing board level work. And that's that's kind of the rarest that I've seen, but I certainly have done a couple of board level repairs at um, repair cafes where I'm like ind individually replacing transistors or chips that I happen to either have on hand or that either the person who's coming to me or I have ordered. And the thing is that um, when it comes to that hierarchy of kind of both difficulty and detail of repair, uh, things are not all equal. Like the wiring fixes and the board level fixes, sometimes the fix itself doesn't take very long at all. But figuring out the, doing the Ooh. diagnosing Diagnosis. Yeah. will wind up taking longer. In the middle parts where you're swapping assemblies, those generally speaking, the diagnosis is quick and the assembly swap is the thing that usually takes more time. And um, that kind of leads into a whole bunch of very specific skills and very specific um, tools that you wind up needing. Like, for example, I've seen 
think three air fryers now where uh, the thermal fuse is, or the thermal switch is the thing that goes on them. And you can't solder a thermal switch because it's right next to a heating element. So you need to have a crimper and the right um, little aglets or ferrules to actually crimp onto those so that the whole thing's held together just the way that it was originally manufactured. So it's getting into each one of those different sets of um, tooling that you need at those different levels is um, it's kind of involved, but it's certainly not impossible to do. Um, I was going to ask if anybody else has any particular tool sets or resources that they run to for that sort of thing. For me, I'm usually well, an I fix it guy, but yeah. Let me, let me just say one thing that I think is really important, and that is don't be afraid to ask for help from one of your fellow fixers. You Last Saturday, it, I was working on a vacuum cleaner, and I got all the screws out, and, I, and now it was one of those pop-it-apart things. So Dan was right next to me, and I said, hey, Dan, can you help me with this? He pulls out his pocket knife, and, and next thing you know, it's open. Now, it had taken me another 20 minutes to, to work on that to figure out that it was a pop open and but don't be, you know, that's, that's what I'm finding out is like, it's much better to go and ask somebody else for help. And, and that's makes things a lot nicer uh, because we, we start to get to know each other and that's mm -hmm. as fixers, we, we all have different skills and let's just make the best use of it in the time we got. That's by two cents. And oh yeah, by the way, you're working with different voltages mm -hmm. and you don't oh, want to use. Oh, the yep. Nice. Have a variac, and then if you want, you can set it down at 12 volts. And and now you're doing everything at 12 volts. And so, like the light bulbs, I mean, all the you know the the light fixtures, you're, you're basically using a safe voltage level, actually up to 24 volts is, is uh, pretty much the legal limit. But but, but keep, yeah, keep I, in mind, Frank. Frank, a variac is is not an isolated oh, device no, no. from the line. Yeah. So no, you, you still have to yeah, do some that. basic safety. I, rules. I think I have one that is though. Yeah. Yeah, if you use an isolation say, transformer can, with it, then you're, then you're off. If you can get your hands on an isolation transformer, that's great. But I, I don't think that the vast majority of repairs that we see are are usually going to be amenable to that, plus which they're darn heavy. I don't right. think yeah. I've ever met an isolation transformer that was less than 30 pounds. And and we're not operating on a we're not we're not sitting on wet wet ground and we're not working usually yeah. on anything but plastic tables. So we're not really mm -hmm. putting ourselves as much at risk as if we were in some environment where we were, you know, our body, the rest of our body. Actually, was contact. can, uh, if, if you don't you mind me one of these, hijacking you know, this. A lot of electronic products, so, sorry to interrupt there, but before we get off the topic, a lot of electronic products have uh, a low voltage uh, external transformer on them. In which okay. case the only part that's that's really could be hazardous is the part from the line cord to the box or to the wall wart if it's a one that plugs directly in. The low voltage line coming out tells you that the rest of the product by and large is probably pretty safe to work with even under power. So, you know, if it's 12 volts up to perhaps 20 volts, uh, it's very unlikely you're gonna get a zap from that unless the power supply itself is shorted. If you can check for that pretty easily. I, another suggestion I come up come up with is is to the device that you're going to work on check to see if it was uh, recalled. Um, mm -hmm. I ran into a dehumidifier one time and uh, I'm checking a dehumidifier and I didn't know everything about it so I asked one of the other guys to come and help me a little bit and and I looked it up and it turns out a whole bunch of dehumidifiers were recalled. They were all made in China and and this guy he says well. I got mine from a thrift store some years ago. They gave it away for free. Well, the mm -hmm. one I was working on was good, but he was afraid that the one that he had back home that catches fire, needs, he needs to do something about it. So the other thing that happened in one case was we were working on a vacuum cleaner that had was battery operated and the power fed that was controlling the voltage, it come and sodded because it was running so hot. Well, we ended up, I said, well, wait a minute, Call the call the company that makes this. So the, the the fixer took it home and he says he called the company and, and he says you know this thing may catch fire. That's as soon as he said that they says don't touch it, don't do anything to it. We'll send you a brand new one. Um, if, sorry, if I may. Sorry. Well, I was going to 
hijack from that was just to explain to folks why we're talking about isolation transformers and that sort of thing. Um, I'm speaking as the electronics professor that I am here. So uh, when you're dealing with voltages, line voltage or house voltage, 120 volts, the human body is linked very, very loosely, capacitively, we call it, to ground, which is what everything else winds up being referenced to. So that's 120 volts above uh, the ground voltage that we sit at or that the outlet sits at. And because of the fact that you have alternating current coming into whatever you're using, if you touch the hot wire, then you are going to provide the least resistance path to ground. What an isolation transformer does is it isolates, literally, that hot from the earth ground. It basically has two sets of coils and it transmits power between those two coils but by way of an alternating magnetic field. And on the output side of an isolation transformer, it's only referenced to the other side of the coil. It's not referenced to ground anymore. So therefore, if you touch that, um, at least in theory, because there is still some leakage, you should not have any current that passes through you to the absolute ground. So um, I hope that was a good enough explanation. But what it comes down to is that by having something like that in between you and the wall, you're creating a safe error way to deal with 120 volts live current if you needed to. It's not something that I think most people will ever need to do in a repair sort of situation. Usually continuity is the primary thing you go with, just beeping or toning out whether or not something's connected, checking resistances. And in a lot of cases that I've seen recently, checking for carbonization on switch and other contacts to make certain that everything's clean and as low of resistance as you can get it. But just so that you know, this is kind of why we're talking about this as being a big deal. Susie, what I would, would, I would say uh, the most, um, one of the most helpful uh, on a uh, more accessible level is a plug-in GFCI. Oh, yeah. It's basically, um, you know, you plug it directly into the wall and it gives you GFCI functionality without needing a GFCI plug. Um, and that gives you a whole level of safety. You know, if you were to accidentally uh, provide a path to ground, it would cut it out immediately. Um, you know, kill it, d disconnecting the device um, from live, um, as well as the neutral it connects both sides from from live. Um, and so, yeah, that's something you can buy at uh, Home Depot. I think Harbor Freight has it, and it's like a twenty dollar device. It's and that can. <laughs> you know, save a life for sure. Good idea. Great idea. Hey, I got a quickie story. Uh, somebody, uh, one of the other fixes was working on a foot vibrator, you know, foot massager, and it wouldn't run. So he's so he's looking at it and he says, well, I'm trying to figure out how to take it apart. So he, he comes over to me and says, you know how to take this apart? I said, well, hold on a minute. So I says, well, let me check something. So we plug it in. I walk over to the, to the line cord with this, my detector, and the line cord was dead. I'll go all the way to the plug at the wall. And that's when it became alive. Well, it turns out because this was a vibrator, it was shaking the line cord and it basically broke oh, right no. the plug. I mean, I thought to myself, boy, it's a good thing. The good thing the guy decided to come over, he would have torn into this thing trying to figure this out. And, you know, it was that simple, you know? So <laughs> it, it's a riot when, you know, when you when when that collaboration really hits home. Well, I think that's a good segue to um, John. He was going to give us a sort of walk in like, you know, it's about doing it in order. And so he was going to give us a little description about sort of, I think, um, sort of what he does when he walks into a cafe to make sure, you know, things go right from the get go. OK. Um, and this has evolved just since last Saturday, just a little bit. Um, when I first walk into a room, I'm, for those of you who absolutely everybody except Susie don't know me at all. I'm a theatrical technical director, all right? Safety is my jam. That's what I do, all right? Um, I walk in and I look for hazards because I've been trained to do that. So uh, that can be any kind of hazard from a trip hazard to extension cords being 40 feet long and only this thick, you know, you name it. 
So the first thing I do is I walk in and I evaluate the space. And I talk to the organizer of that space because I've been dealing with a number of brand new or recently uh, revived cafes in my immediate vicinity. So I talk to the people there and I say, hey, you know, they have extended, they, they think they know what they're doing. The organizers think that, that by providing daisy chained um, power strips that they're doing us all a great favor. And I, I disabuse them of that notion right away, all right? I show them the extension cord that I bring with me, which is an industrial quality thing. And they look at it and they've never seen it before, all right? And I said, you don't have to buy one of these, but you wanna know that they exist. I bring one of those portable GFCIs with me and I show it to them and I said, 20 bucks on Amazon. And they go in and they've sworn to me that they will go buy a half dozen for the electrical tables, all right? Um, when I see extension cords coiled around the food table, I say, look, you can't put that here. You gotta either remove it, run it around the perimeter or tape it to the carpet, depending upon the venue you're in. That may or may not, one or those alternatives may be acceptable here, but not somewhere else. You gotta know. The other thing is that they, pack us in some venues too close together, all right? Where we're tripping over one another's tool boxes and things just to, to squirrel into some cubby hole where they've got us. And why do they have us there? Because that's where the electrical outlets are, all right? So there's all sorts of practical issues here, all right? Um, that you want to have a space. Now, I will say that the Cortland venue that I was at for the first time this past Saturday was, was uh, laid out very well, all right? They put us around the perimeter of an indoor basketball court. And fortunately, there were electrical outlets all around that perimeter. So people were quite well spread out. On the downside, People were so well spread out that all of those daisy chained little uh, power strips wouldn't reach. So everybody came looking for Johnny's big extension cord, right? And that's a problem because you cannot absolutely be sure that the people who want to use that know what they're doing with it, all right? The, they very quick, the guys who come in unprepared very quickly realize that they're new to this and are unprepared. And that's fine, they're here to learn and I have no problem with it whatsoever. I'm happy to teach them everything I ever learned, but they have to be stopped from just willy nilly plugging things in as they deem necessary. Um, I had to call a couple of guys out for saying, hey, because I knew there was a lamp coming in where I had previous warning that the lamp in question is gonna th throw sparks according to the customer. Every single time I plug it in, ah, what should I do? Please fix this. It's like, oh, why are you bringing this damn thing in here? All right. So um, I had this in the back of my mind waiting, waiting for this thing to show up. It didn't show up to me, but it showed up to a couple of guys down, down the basketball court for me. And I heard them talking while I was dealing with a different customer. And I heard them say, well, let's just plug it in, see what happens. And I immediately pointed to them. I said, don't you dare plug that thing in without testing it first. And they looked at me and they said, what do you mean? I said, continuity checks. I'm sorry, that's required. And this one guy looked at me, he says, and I could hear him, but he didn't voice it yet. He was going to ask me, what's that? And I said, do you know what that is? And the fellow next to him said, yes. And he held up his multimeter. He says, I can do that. And I said, great, please do, all right? And the fellow originally who was gonna just plug it in and find out what happened said, well, wait a minute, it's just a lamp. How much electricity can there be in that? And there was not an ounce of cynicism or um, um, you know, wise assness or whatever you wanna call it in his voice. This was a sincere question from a fellow who was simply not well informed. He was a good man. He was a smart man. He, was, he is capable of being taught. 
but he just showed up because he was willing and the organizers were willing, were more than happy to have him be precisely because he was willing. The organizers are adept at organizing, but they don't know bupkis about what we're all talking about, all right? So I think that what we need to do is to provide some basic background for some of these guys because they're gonna get a shock of their life if they don't, you know, pay attention to what we're trying to teach them, all right? So when I told him that by just simply plugging it in, he was basically taking a chance that maybe there was some electricity in there that was a few thousand times more than what was minimally necessary to kill him. And everybody stopped because I didn't realize that I said it loudly enough that it echoed around the entire basketball court. It was a brilliant sunny day on a Saturday. So every, there was like nobody there, all right? Um, if this was a busy rainy day, no one might've heard it. So um, they all kind of stopped and they, then they went through their business and I went through mine and, and things can, went on and everything was fine. But so um, the issue here is that when it comes to matters of electrical safety, we have at least two different groups of people. We have the guys like all of us who pretty much know what's going on, all right? We all have, like you, some of you have already said, different skill sets, all right? Did more knowledge about this than that, and that's all fine. But we are also dealing with a substantial minority of people who could join our ranks if given the proper relevant information. And it's not merely a saying that we have to use this or that because some of the, 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 the things that I've read so far, while they may make sense to all of us and be decent refreshers and the information is of good quality, they speak to people who already have the background like us. They do not speak to the people who do not have that background because every third sentence you're reading, the reader is saying, but why, why, all right? If we answer those questions, then we will have done a great service to those people because they're the guys who are showing up in substantial part. They need to know. They can learn it, they're good people and they're smart and they have transferable skills, all right? So um, when you walk into a cafe, never let the customer, or the guy sitting next to you, unless you know him well enough already, start plugging things into your, your electrical outlet, be it GFCI enabled or not, because you don't know what he's going to do with it. And the guys who are not prepared, they will know who is, and they will just presume that everything is fine. And that is an erroneous assumption. And I think I've said too much. So go ahead, Susie. Oh, I appreciate it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The other thing that's helpful, two things mm -hmm. out of that that's interesting is that is there's been there was one repair cafe where somebody plugged something in and it blew the circuit breaker. Well, you know oh, what? Broken all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but the trouble was nobody knew where the circuit breaker panel was. So oh, yeah. it was the blue station. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so one of the things that I do is I have my my uh, extension box has a 10 amp circuit breaker on it. The other thing that some people do is they use a light bulb in series with in series with uh, the uh, the device they're testing, like a 40 or 50 watt light bulb screwed into a base, yep. and and that and that gives you some protection in, in case you have a short at the other side, yep. a lamp or whatever else. So yeah, that's that's there's there's other other neat tricks but yeah, oh, yeah there's all sorts of tricks but i mean you know i mean i could empty my entire workshop and show up at a repair cafe and still not have the one thing that i need you know i mean there's only so much crap I can yeah. carry. well that's why we we work together i mean that's the thing is you you, you know we once we get to know each other we know who's got what yeah. and and that's really the the long and short of it i mean that's the that's the beauty of the repair cafes because i mean there's some of us that have been to 70 or 100 repair cafes so we know who's who knows what and who's got what mm -hmm. and that's a real cool thing yeah i think i'm the only guy i know who has a hot air rework station normally 
have one. So then again, people keep using it for a shrink tube. So, you know. <laughs> Speaking of which, shrink it provides tube. very precise temperature control for heat shrink, though. Darn right. Um, heat shrink, yay or nay? Who's anybody got any opinions on that? I, oh, yeah, I, I, I love like, it. I bring my, my hot air gun and my heat shrink tubing to every repair cafe. I've used it quite a bit. And then the other Harbor Freight, Harbor Freight <laughs> shrink wrap, I suggest highly. What's that, Pete? It, uh, they have also a uh, a marine version that has glue in it yeah. to basically yep. seal it. So yes. if you're going to if you're going to fix an extension cord that's going to be outside, mm -hmm. you could use this marine shrink tubing over the connections, and you're back in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't remember what the number is. I want to say it's ADS one hundred. That's the uh, the 3M version. That's adhesive line. But um, the other thing that I was going to point out to folks is if you haven't started using them yet, um, I would highly recommend getting the solder bearing um, shrink tubes. Uh, these ones allow you to do a butt joint and with a regular heat gun, actually melt a bead of solder, a little ring of it that's on the inside. And it has other pieces of shrink tube that actually hold the insulation in place. And then that too is a adhesive line. So you get a full piece of shrink tube and a soldered butt joint all in one go with just one heat. So those things okay. have saved my butt more times than I can count. And I can post an Amazon link to an assortment if you'd like. Must be very low temperature solder in that. Uh, it is. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it's a bismuth tin lead mix. Yeah, it melts at about 140 degrees. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Hey, another interesting thing is uh, a woman brought a lamp in and it didn't have a polarized plug on it. And uh, so I'm, she says, oh, I, can you put a switch in line for me? And I said, sure, I can put it. Well, there was already one in line. But, you know, I looked at the plug, one polarized. And I says, well, you know, this light doesn't have a polarized plug on it. And it's mm -hmm. probably better that it did. But I didn't have a plug to put on it. And I didn't. I says, well. But that may be something we want to consider that if we find somebody bringing something in and it doesn't have a polarized plug on it to uh, put it on so that we make sure that the uh, the shell of the out of the lamp is uh, is connected not onto the hot side. So, I mean, because I that, you know, it's 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 some of these lamps. I don't know where they come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, you know, they they know. never never used to put a polarized plug on them. I mean that that one that that's on this lamp that I brought in is uh, just two straight arms and and uh, and as a matter of fact, the rib on the side of the cable is going to the wrong side of the outlet on this lamp. So those lamps come from the fifties, I think. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite I, common I, I, back in the fifties, but they also how many lamps have you seen that didn't have the underwriters not Mm -hmm. I oh, see yeah. them every day. Yes, they, every time we, every every time, is it, on under, it is not missing things to to keep things in place, and it's just not right. Yeah, they, people look they, at me like I'm crazy when I say you guys to tie a knot in the wire. Yeah, yeah strain relief is strain relief, right? Yeah, yeah something like that. Um, I'm yeah. looking. The other thing I like is. A, a plastic light bulb and this one is in my toolbox it's a little uh, i don't know 10 watt light bulb but it's an led and it's all plastic so you could drop it and it's not going to break so it's kind of handy that there's people don't always bring a light bulb in it's a great test bulb yeah works like a charm and i always recommend people when they bring these lamps and i says listen put an led lamp uh, bulb in there because it's going to be less strain on the switch because those the old you know regular filament bulbs they the startup current is burns the contact so mm -hmm. I, i'm a, i think i'll have to check one day to see what the surge pulse looks like on on some of these uh, led bulbs because they do have switching power yeah. supply side so i could be i could be shooting myself in the foot without thinking those are about. usually about i think the the startup current for the uh, to charge up the caps and those still keeps it somewhere below 50 milliamps. That sounds about right. Yeah, because oh, they're, they're usually um, for a 10 watt equivalent, it's usually only about 1 to 1. 1.5 actual watts of draw at 120 volts. So 
Okay, so V over or P over V equals I. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you they've got come a long it, way since their first days when they were originally making them. They've they're much cleaner now too. Yeah, definitely. Well, when I have some spare time, I'll put a scope on it and take a look at what the <laughs> yeah. what, what this what the what the startup spike looks like. Um, so I, I'd like to just throw out if you know so if there's anything you can say that might be helpful to someone who's starting out, who, who's maybe a little less proficient. Um, if there's, you know, I know, I know how hard it is when you're well versed to go back to basics. But is there anything? And, and maybe it's a discussion that we've had amongst ourselves about, you know, we have this, we're working on a fixer questionnaire that a lot of the people here helped me vet for vetting electrical fixers so we could gain, um, vet, vet their knowledge. But again, we're going to need you guys, you're going to need some electrical fixers to help us read the answers because <laughs> I, as an organizer, wouldn't really know what to do with that. But, and then we're also talking about pairing a new fixer with an experienced fixer at the first cafe that they do. Where they can fix, but they're being or first a first couple of cafes because yeah. I, I have no problem, you know, working with people. I mean, I bring kids in and they yes, I mentor yeah. kids. Yeah. kids. So yeah. some and down in Yorktown, the same thing. Yes. So yeah, it's not just the first one or two. It could be, you know, say hey, no, I want this newbie to sit and be, be sitting next to me, and 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 that would be better for everybody. Right. You know, and and we so, all really need to train new organized. people because the organizers are the ones who are gonna help direct the newbies to the guys who know what they're doing. Because if I walk into a new cafe, you know, any day of the week, I mean, people have already been, been reassigned or just going to the, gravitating to the people that they already know, if any. Um, and so there needs to be, I think, a, a um, um, a bit of, of direction given to the people who organize these events to say, hey, if you've got somebody new, go set him up with Pete, you know, go set him up with Joe and, and let him sit for, you know, an hour or half an afternoon, uh, the whole session, whatever. All right. Um, and if it's a high school kid or something, I'd be happy to sit with him or her and teach him everything I ever learned. And over the course of a month, if it came to it, um, but you just can't like say, here's two hours with Johnny and then you're good to go. All right. You gotta, you gotta prove it. There's, there's more to it than, than just saying, oh yeah, twist this wire here and go. Right. I, I guess I was talking about if it's a new fixer, but they seem to be proficient, but still going through a safe. So if you go with them for one fix, one cafe and they seem to really know what they're doing, then cut and loose. But no, well, like, some people need well, to when, when I go to a new place that I've never been before, I say, <clears throat> I've done 75 right. of it already so if a new person comes in you say well how many of these have you done four right. well right. if you only done four we're going to put you with somebody that you're going to kind of look over you know look sit alongside because four cafes god only knows what you know i mean you may you know that the whole atmosphere in a cafe is something that you kind of blend into eventually so yeah, yeah. but you know convivial a, atmosphere, organized you can yourself. ask that question that's not, not paying a big attention one. to what you're doing because right. you're talking to everybody. Yeah. I want to, I want to call on Peter. He is from fix it clinics out in Berkeley, which have a little bit of a different, it's a different mandate really than repair cafes where the, you fix it with, you learn to fix it as the guest. Oh, thanks for having me. So, but guys, let me tell you that I grew up in the Bronx. All right. So <laughs> uh, you know, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got a problem with that, buddy? Um, no. Yeah, okay, I know so, that guy. In them on the uh, when we were doing the uh, the repair cafes online, so yeah, right, yeah, all right. So, so we encourage all of the fixers to float around the room and look at everything. Okay, that that I tell my fixers to act like your doctors on grand rounds in a hospital, touch every mm -hmm. item lightly, and that's enabled because we're empowering the person with the item to affect most of the repair themselves. So we, you know we're asking them to do the disassembly. We're, and we're asking them to sew up the patient after we're done. So we're not trying to like, we're trying to teach people how to fish as opposed to hand them a fish. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I would say is, the other thing we do is we have an observer category. If you're unclear, if you're nervous about your ability to be a fixer, that you can always sign up for one of our events as an observer. Mm -hmm. And as an observer, you're like one of the interns in the hospital following the doctors around on grand rounds. 
So, so that's the way we, you know, that's the way we sort of vet and scale people up to the level where they feel comfortable and they can look around and see whatever repair they want to handle. And as you know, and I know, a lot of the repairs are low voltage. I mean, we're talking about 120 stuff here. And as Frank knows from the intergalactic Zoom fix it clinics that, you know, when we see stuff in Europe and Australia or overseas, they're playing with 220. That is serious yeah. voltage. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. so we understand that that's, that's an issue, but, but honestly, a lot of the stuff we're looking at at our events, it's really, it's, it's, you know, it's 12 volts and under. I think your observer category, I think is, is an excellent idea. Definitely. I think um, the grand rounds on the hospital thing is, is a good one too, myself. I agree. <laughs> um, I would counter though, from the perspective of the smaller cafe, because for me, we usually only have about three fixers and I'm the one of them and I'm also the organizer. And that's for both of the two that I usually do. And so, I mean, uh, for those of us run smaller yeah. stuff, we can't help but be on grand rounds all the time. So it, you get um, to know really quick what your uh, your coworkers are able to do. And um, maybe... One thing that I've been thinking about with regards to electrical is um, if your organizers can support you by making more cafes more often, that might not be a bad idea for larger cafes. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. We had we had 97 folks come in to Vassar College. It's uh, two week, about two weeks ago. We had uh, 97 people come in for for with stuff at the Vassar College. It was a it was some operation. A lot of mm -hmm. fun, though. Yeah. Our last repair okay. cafe, we had 137 people come through. Where was that? In Schenectady. Oh, okay. I've been, yeah. I was up there. Yeah, you've been there. Westchester. Yeah, I was up there with West. Yeah. I, Whereas I, we have I, 15. <laughs> yes. No, it's, it's, it's becoming an issue, and we, uh, we're trying to figure out how to grow as it's growing. And, um, you know, and so we want to train new people. You know, we have a lot of very experienced people and then we have people who might be interested. But are, so I think, the you know, having like an official journeyman, right, like an official yeah. observer category before you can, you know, I mean, we, we hate to put rules in place. But if there's anything we're going to put a rule in place about is electrical fixing. So I was just going to say apprenticeship is actually the model that we've been discussing here yes. and just not naming. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, mentors or whatever we want to call ourselves have to be mindful of the safety, but it's a great idea. And mm -hmm. recruiting some high school students is something that we've done and it works really well. We had three of them in our last repair cafe and they were very, very interested and very helpful. They had their hands full a lot of times just helping some of the uh, busier stations, mm -hmm. moving stuff around, but they were also full of questions and watching and observing and being able to grab a hold of something and do things and they want to come back but also but I, I was up i was up at this i think it was a schenectady repair cafe a woman brings in a, a, a big a floor lamp and she comes in with her daughter and her daughter is like uh in seventh grade or something like that and, and this woman she says oh yeah my daughter she plays three different instruments and I'm thinking to myself, well, if she's playing instruments, she's got good hands, right? So I says, how'd you like to work on this lamp? Well, believe it or not, this girl did pretty much the whole thing. I showed her how to use the wire strippers, and she put, she, she worked alongside me like it was it was like nothing. And and then when yeah. and we I got a really good picture of it too. So you know that was that was a, a very positive uh, opportunity to and 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 enlist the kids and 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 that kind of thing. So yeah, and she loved it. I mean, you know, her, 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 the mom was just all excited that, you know, her daughter did this. And otherwise, she wouldn't have had an opportunity. I mean, you know, sometimes there's single parent households. And then how does the girls get their hands dirty? Well, they got to come to a repair cafe. <laughs> I mean, we could advertise that. Get your hands dirty. No, I think it, get I think your, get your hands dirty. Yeah. It, it, sometimes I, I'm a jewelry fixer and it can be really busy and you just forget. You forget to, you know, until all of a sudden you're so busy that you're like, hey, can you cut this? these knotted beads apart you know you forget to employ people so i mean maybe we all need to take a, a page from from fix it clinics and really try to get people fixing more if we can uh, and dominic you have your hand raised so yeah I want to call. um 
it's a little bit of far afield from the security questions and the safety questions, but if you don't mind, uh, kind of an organizational question that was just raised along with the notion of, you know, 137 people showing up. I guess my, before, I'd like to go back to an intro, but uh, about myself and what we're, we're doing in Seattle, it's actually Shoreline Tool Library just opened with a new, you know, we have our fixer nights, on, I think on the third Wednesdays. I've yet to, I personally am kind of a, you know, semi-competent um, do-it-yourselfer when it comes to electrical, comfortable to go to the breaker box and, and wire a circuit. But other than that, I don't really know a lot about it and hope to uh, be attending these. My question is really this. When you have that many people or when there's, you know, the threat of that many people showing up, is there any, uh, is anyone doing anything to like schedule or anything organizationally that you're, um, you know, queuing people up so that, you know, if 137 people come and you've got three fixers, they ain't going to get to it, right? So I'll turn it back. Okay, can I, <laughs> can I elaborate on what we do a little bit? And I'll try to answer that. Uh, what we did is we recognized a problem when we had our previous event, when we had a lot of people show up and we weren't really prepared for it well. So... <clears throat> I've made some uh, whiteboard stands for each repair station and our ushers, the people that escort people from the check-in station to the repair stations, write the um, a code on the uh, whiteboards to kind of keep a, a flow going. And the code basically has got a number and a code for like, W would be wood, then jewelry would be a J. So it'd be a W, J, you know, whatever the logical code might be. And that way the people waiting can see where they are in the queue. So the usher, yeah. release the, the number yeah. on the whiteboard is something is finished and put the new one up. So if you've got number seven and number six is being worked on, you know, you don't have to get worried about if you're going to be done next. And you can sit back and wait. Down in Yorktown, they actually schedule it online. So yeah. um, then yeah. the, the uh, York, Yorktown Heights Repair Cafe at the Lutheran Church, it's all scheduled online. So people know that they got a time slot at a, a particular time. And that's how they do it down there. There's no, usually there's no overload in, in that yeah, situation. They use sign up genius is what they yeah. use. Yeah, yeah, not not cafes I wanted to, 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 I guess, third, you know, contribute to the say to say that the Yorktown Cafe, in my opinion, has the best pre-registration system going that I have seen in my limited experience here in a half a dozen different cafes. Please look it up. Yorktown Heights, New York. Their sign up genius thing is, in my view, excellent. And it provides us fixers with advance warning with what's may be coming in the door. If it's a brilliant sunny day, it may not come in the door. But if it's a lousy, snowy, rainy day, it will certainly be walking in the door. And if you need to bring some tools with you to fix this, that, or the other specific thing, well, then you have advanced warning to be able to do so and therefore satisfy more people. I think uh, Peter, that, Peter has his hand up, and then I'll go to Dean. We tried that, but unfortunately, our community is uh, mostly rather um, low income, and the digital divide bites us pretty hard for a lot of the community. So we got a lot of complaints about people not being able to do the online registration. Mm. So, so guys, I'll say very early on, I figured out that our events were never going to scale. You know that that if we if we couldn't figure out how to match, you have to make both sides of the market. You have to make the people coming with broken things. You have to have the people there to help them with their repair, which is part of the reason why I set it fix a clinic in the way I set it up, so that it's not about it's more it's about enabling people and empowering people to affect their own repair, and that in an ideal fix a clinic, the role of participant and fix it coach blurs, and everyone's just helping everybody else out because everybody knows something about something. The other thing I try to do is I encourage all of our fix-it coaches to cross-train, okay? I want, and, and Skillshare, to know, it, it's really about sort of making everybody in our society have that skill, have that ability to repair. 
And believe me, between New York State passing right to repair, California passing right to repair, Emily's on here, Minnesota passing right to repair, just those three states means 20% of the US population is covered under some sort of right to repair act starting this year. And Colorado and, and Oregon just passed this last week. So people are gonna, people are interested in this and, and the interest in our events is just gonna explode. So I put in our link, I put in my link uh, in the links, what we use for our check-in form, doesn't cover every fix a clinic, doesn't cover the ones in Minnesota, but I'm gonna put in the next link will be what that looks like to the repairers. Cause I agree with you, it's wonderful as a repairer to kind of know what you're gonna see at an upcoming event. I just wanna make a comment about organizing and, and which, which is interesting because uh, I was involved with the organizing of the Peak Skill uh, Repair Cafe. And we had five organizations co-sponsored that event. And, and they were all quite different. We had Peace Guild Toastmasters that basically kind of instigated the whole thing. And then the library in Peekskill, the town of Peekskill, the Peekskill Cortland Amateur Radio Club, and, mm -hmm. and some other green organization. So all of those organizations got their little two cents on the flyer. And then also... Uh, after the uh, during the event, the local cable channel came in and they shot videos of, of, of half a dozen of those people. So there was publicity that was free for those different organizations to basically entice people to come in. Plus, you know, the, the radio club people are basically technical people. So they had their own table and they were fixing stuff left and right. So, you know, we can we can go out and tag some of these other organizations uh, and 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 say, hey, uh, you can get some free advertisement, and it looks good for you. So, you know, it, yeah. with, with all due respect, um, we need, I think, because precisely because of the broad recognition and and airplay that we are all getting, especially here on the East Coast, and I'm sure it's similar on the West Coast, that. You know this repair cafe thing is happening and bring your stuff in and people all want to do their bit to preserve the planet as we know it and all that jazz we have probably an outsized duty to make sure that no inadvertent unwitting error occurs to cause harm to someone which is why we're convening this meeting in the first place all right, mm -hmm. to make sure that it's about safety and that everything that we can do and write down or, or otherwise record on video or whatever for both the fixers, the organizers in particular, and the general layperson who comes in with a lamp or God knows or an air fryer to fix, um, that they all recognize that we are adhering to a certain degree of competency and standards that are at least nationally, if not internationally recognized. And that what we're doing is in accordance with those general principles and that they have not to fear anything. Because when I talk to people at the other side of the table, they say, if I touch this, will it, will it electrocute me? It's like, no, don't worry. All right. You just turn the key and it comes on. It's okay. I mean, you're, you're dealing with people who have, especially the younger sort, who have never seen a three-way light bulb before. All right. It, it, the, 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 the discrepancy in knowledge between us and the average consumer is growing tremendously. I'm shocked in the figurative sense. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Only a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> that 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 these people don't know what a three-way bulb is. I mean, I mean, the simplest repair I had was just simply to show her to plug in a three-way bulb, and and you're done. Your lamp is fine. All right, uh, Dean, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I, you know, I and and I agree, I agree with with John. You know, you have to, um, you have to make sure that the re repairs are are going to be done to standards and safely. And, and that the people who are observing the repairs understand that you're taking care to do that. And, and, and that's the reason why it might take a little longer mm -hmm. to do a repair than it would otherwise, because you're, you're unplugging it every time you want to, you know, touch a screw or whatever. 
Um, I wanted, wanted to bring up the same lamp a, mo a month or two or three later that came in the month, you know, the, the session before. I have seen a number of repeat problems come in because something didn't get quite fixed appropriately. All right. That should not occur. If the lamp was built 50 years ago and has worked up until now, it should work for another 50 years after it leaves our hands. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, wanted to bring up before we talk about, before we um, get Sorry. back away from safety again, there, there aren't too many products that are inherently lethal anymore because TVs don't have high yeah, volume, yeah. CRT TVs don't come in anymore. You know, everything usually runs, all electronic products run on lower voltages. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one product that I wanted to ask the experience fixers here what they do when somebody brings a microwave oven in. Because there's a product that if it's in the hands of somebody who doesn't understand the way interlocks Absolutely. work on microwaves, can be lethal. Yeah. Absolutely okay. lethal. Mm -hmm. There are three switches in a microwave. They, if one of them fails, you don't know which one it is unless you know how to troubleshoot it. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you replace the fuse without realizing the fuse blew because the switch went bad, you can end up with you know a product that's going to radiate an entire room of people. <laughs> and Dean, I, you know, if we're talking about you know YouTube videos and all this other stuff. Um, that kind of thing, it doesn't come in at least to the cafes I've seen too often. But when it does, I think that a lot of the guys, myself included, would be um, um, edified to understand you know from a, a you know a how-to kind of video. You know, how do you really deal with this stuff? Sure. Right. I think that would be a, a, an excellent, more high end thing for people to learn from. Yeah. You've only got three videos guys that, 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 that touch one at our repair cafe. Yeah. yeah, I fixed one over in Newburgh, and all I needed was a new fuse. Right. Well, you got to be careful, though, Frank, because the fuse might have blown because. Yeah, the, the, that's right. Fail-safe switch went bad. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I had one come in when I was doing a cafe down in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And the problem was that there was a good amount of soot around one of the circuit boards. So I knew something was wrong at the board level. And I really did not feel comfortable going into board level on microwave. So... I literally just told the guy, listen, you may be able to find a repair shop that will be able to resume liability for this. But in my opinion, given the amount of time that it would take to fix this, it is going to be better to uh, just get a new one. That being said, um, if you want to leave it here as a donation for parts, I know personally I can take care of making certain this winds up either in e-waste or I can take care of reusing certain parts inside of it. Uh, and that's what we wound up doing. So that was, that's a nice option to give them, especially if you have use of some of the parts in something that they're going to be getting rid of anyway. And if you don't feel as though you can necessarily handle the liability for that particular item. That being said, the same guy also brought in a toaster oven that I, I, he really was into destroying electrical appliances from his kitchen, apparently. And um, the toaster oven, it was just that there was a, it was actually a mechanical problem. It was a jammed knob on the uh, thermostat knob. So the thermostat switch wasn't engaging. So with a little bit of, um, you know, canned air and uh, some torque, I managed to get that loose. But uh, the microwave was more of a no-go for me, especially seeing the condition of the interior. But that's the thing. If you're capable of opening a microwave to see what's wrong on the inside, you should also be capable of knowing when to stop so uh peter yeah there's no substitute for common sense <laughs> all right Th that said that? um <laughs> we typically take on microwaves because as people have noted it's often easy and the major thing to be aware of is the high voltage capacitor that's over by the microwave emitter and you know for those of those of the fix-it coaches who feel comfortable doing it and, and a lot of us do now, we short it out with a needle nose pliers and we move on. 
and and we can we can keep it safe. I, I also keep a rubber mat and say basically this is the dangerous part of the microwave. I'm putting this rubber mat over it. Don't go in that part. Actually, so, all good call. The, the, the 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 hype about you know um, air fryers. I mean, I've seen a number of air fryers come in, and um, if there were some explicit um, videos or, or or documents, you know about how properly to to examine an air fryer, I think that would be uh, most illuminating for a lot of people because these are relatively new and they eat up all the current your 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 circuit can provide. So um, they may not that they, they might not eat up they might eat up all the current that your extension cord can handle and then some and you don't want to see things melting at a cafe. People who have explicit experience with those things, I think, would be uh, well advised to uh, edify everyone else. There have been a couple of really, really good repair uh, videos that I've actually found on YouTube for air fryers. And that's about the only place I've found anything. I haven't really seen anything on iFixit yet. Um, and I haven't really found any independent manuals. And the service manuals are just non-existent. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I worked on an air fryer, and thank God I had my circuit breaker because <laughs> it kicked out the circuit breaker. And I says, "Well, you got to take this into the kitchen of this facility where they have another circuit." And I because I didn't want to, I didn't want them to plug it into one of the other outlets right there because it could have, it could, it could have killed the, they could have blow a breaker and a bunch of bunch of fixes would have been out of business. So I says, "No, take this into the kitchen, and and there'll be a separate circuit in there, and plug it in." And uh, so that's what how it how it went down. But yeah, you got a good question here, and I it's eight o'clock. So I mean, I know people want to wrap up, but I also if there are people who haven't gotten to say just something, uh, we have a lot of really experienced people here who might just have a few just a moment to say something. But someone asks, speaking of fires at cafes, do you have a fire extinguisher or one of those fire blankets, or do the organizers? I don't know the answer to that. Does, has anyone ever seen that at a cafe? Is that something we should be adding? I have not seen a fire, but I carry a blanket. But the cafe days. really should have that, right? And part of it, like we don't, um, I mean, aid kits, that's another thing. I know that. I, I seeing... worry, I worry that the organizers, those whom I've met personally anyway, would be repulsed by the idea that such a thing would be necessary because they are rather tentative individuals who have no concept of what we're talking about whatsoever. And if we thought that, if they thought that we had to bring in fire extinguishers and, and blankets, that they might not host a cafe. Um, somebody who's an organizer, and I haven't spoken up yet, but I'm in Minnesota. As somebody who's going to be an organizer, we have a grant from the state of Minnesota. We're starting clinics in five counties around the state here in the next year and a half. I am very much on the other end of that. And fire safety and medical safety is at the top of my list. So I will <laughs> let you know that's the opposite. But I didn't really think about until right now whether like, you know, like a fire blanket might be better, probably. So then you're not making a huge mess if you did need one. And having had to use one from a microwave fire in my own home one time, <laughs> you know, I, I would rather not use a fire extinguisher. But I was just curious if people had recommendations, if fire blankets can be used for electrical fires. I never, you know how like not all fire extinguishers can be used for electrical, so I just wasn't sure. Um, but we have, through our grant, we have money to buy supplies for all of our partners. Yeah. And so we, we want to make sure like as the organizers, each county is suited. So if there, you know, is a recommendation, I, and I think especially because it's going to be the county is hosting, they want the safety is at the forefront of their minds. Absolutely. Um, so if I may on that, um, speaking, of, first of all, speaking as an organizer um, and an electrical fixer at the same time, um, the two buildings that I operate my repair cafes in, um, both are public spaces. Both of them, I know exactly where the fire extinguishers are. I make certain when somebody is a new fixer that I show them where the bathroom is, where the first aid kit in the bathroom is, where the fire extinguishers are. And we have ABC standard uh, fire extinguishers. We don't have a fire blanket, but that being said, we usually have at least one or two silicone mats laying around, especially because of the fact that I've got a soldering station. So usually those can be used in place of for smaller uh, mm -hmm. fires, but 
we also do the work on top of them, so it's really hard to move it around. Either way, though, standard ABC fire extinguishers should be in any of the public places that we're hosting these events in. And as soon as you get your volunteers in, make certain that they know where those are. Yeah, and in our case, in most situations, the events will be moving around and they won't be in one place. So we'll want to make sure. That's kind of why I'm inclined mm -hmm. to have in the kit for each of our, our host partners to just have something that they would bring from site to site. Um, also, I would say that the Kitty um, standard um, vehicular fire extinguishers, the ABC vehicular ones, are great for a toolkit. I usually carry one in the back of my car, and it usually comes into the repair cafes with me as well. But Emily, I would say that um, from my parochial expect uh, my parochial experience here in theater, you can have all the fire extinguishers and blankets you like, but unless you appoint one or two people specifically to manage them and to be aware and to throw them or use them as appropriately when necessary, then they are useless otherwise. Appoint people to be your fire wardens, protectors, whatever you want to call them, all right? The people who will drop everything and throw that blanket, use that extinguisher, because otherwise everybody else is going to stand around and watch and say, I thought the other guy was going to do it. Wouldn't right. that typically be the job of the person who lit the fire? You yeah. Know, yeah. Common yeah. Sense. No, he's going to be he's going to be grilling yeah. sausage. <laughs> yeah. Who the heck is this guy? <laughs> John, is it you? <laughs> So any last points that people want to make? I mean, I'm happy to stay on, but I just, I don't want to use people's time if they don't want to. Is there anything out that, I mean, these are really important things. I, I honestly, I never had thought about that. I, I, you know, it's a good point. I'm throwing salient points into the chat so I can. One thing them. that, um, that's going to sound ludicrously overcautious to some people, but probably very, very reasonable to others is if you have newer electrical fixers, Make sure they wash their hands after they're done. I know this sounds weird, but especially with solder, as uh, Mitch Altman likes to say, if you don't wash your hands after soldering, you lose your friend, all your friends. Because if you don't wash your hands, you, you wind up eating lead. You eat lead, and then you go crazy. You go crazy, you get institutionalized. Then your friends don't want to come and see you. You lose all your friends. So wash your hands. But also, there's a lot of phenolic resins and a lot of older electrical uh, appliances. There's a lot of other stuff that's just plain nasty. And hand washing from a safety perspective is really key to, especially if you're taking apart a vacuum cleaner. Have any of you guys wound up with like a snoot full of vacuum dust? It's nasty. So just clean up afterwards and in between each one of the items as well. I know they can get stacked up, but give your if you're an organizer, give your fixers. If you're a fixer, give your fellow fixers time to clean up in between projects because otherwise you get a cluttered workspace and that gets dangerous. It's it's it's. Back I wish people uh, would bring would clean the stuff they bring in to get repaired too. I've seen people bring things in that obviously were just sitting in their basement for about ten years before they decided to get them, try to get them repaired. You know, and and I've seen other cafes, nothing in our network, but I've or once in a while seen them specify that you have to bring it clean. But, you know, nobody reads anything. But um, a bucket of wipes would be nice to have on hand. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. We can add that well, to our I mean, One of the biggest just, problems I've run into is the fact that the thing that needs to be cleaned is usually also the thing that winds up breaking the thing that needs fixing. Because people just don't know how to get inside of things to clean them internally. But I, well, I just want to remind fixers that they, you know, it's in our house rules and we all know this and it's not easy because we're all givers. That's why we're doing this. You mm -hmm. can always say no to fix. You can say no. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's just not, you know, if it's not in shape to deal with and it's a busy day. I mean, this is something we're seeing too. If it's a three hour fix and there's a four, you know, people waiting. And a half hour to do your job. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. A woman brought in a vac a, a, a electric lawnmower and uh, we, so we take we we take it apart. She's taking it apart, and wouldn't you know it? A mouse had built a uh, a nest. <laughs> in so he says, "Out it goes," and she took it all outside, cleaned it all up, and then brought it back in. But yeah, you, you, I mean, you don't know. I mean, it's like yeah, who, who, 
who thought about that? But you know, they, my mouse figured out how to get it inside and make a house. So there you go. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Peter Mui. Have yeah, because of our emphasis on self-help, we have that problem less often. And one of the questions on our registration form is, what have you done to try and fix it? And mm. I've noticed that a lot of people abandon our form and abandon our event after that. And mm -hmm. I'm fine with that, okay? I think a lot of repairs happen just because people try it themselves and don't think, oh, I'm gonna go to this event and they're gonna help me, right? So. Mm -hmm. I would ask you guys to think long and hard about sort of the service orientation of your offering, right? Uh -huh. Think about, you can still be generous, okay? In offering information, you can still be generous in, in empowering people. You don't have to be, you know, like, look, I, I'm one of you guys, so I know I have to hold it and shake it and stuff, but I tell my fix-it coaches, how much can you do without even ever touching the item? Mm -hmm. How do you really empower the person themselves? Okay, to, so to, now, to affect the repair themselves. I have a I have a, 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 a real deal family story to share. My my newly minted son-in-law, all right, he's a great guy, all right. He's 35 years old. He doesn't know the north end of a south end of a screwdriver, all right? Because why? Like all young men, like uh, I shouldn't say all, but like many young men his age, he didn't grow up in an environment where his dad was a blue collar guy, all right? Who fixed things and who made things work. Therefore, neither he nor his dad had any knowledge to, to share amongst one another. And there's also a societal thing, at least in, in some parts of the world, where you're not supposed to be doing this. This is what we have other people to do and to take care of. And therefore, you'll never need to know. I know people in Westport, Connecticut, who hire guys like us to change light bulbs. And I'm not kidding you, all right, at $100 an hour, all right? I'm sorry, but this is the world that some of us live in. These younger folk have no clue, all right? It's not their fault. Some of them might like to learn, but they're too busy doing whatever, whatever they're all doing. Playing video games. Yeah, that probably too. Um, and so, you know, um, it would be nice to empower them, but you first have to interest them because they will not gravitate toward it unless until they become homeowners themselves and then find out how expensive it is to hire guys like us to fix things. <laughs> All right. So, so what if the real job is to clone us? Why don't you know, uh, I, I, yeah. I've, I've been concerned that what, we have a false fitness function where we gauge the success of our events by the number of people who actually come and participate. And yeah, I've been all really since the beginning. Guys and gray haired guys on this, about, on this chat, all right? I yeah, mean, I have a few gray hairs, yeah. I'm uh, with you. you got a few too. I mean, okay. yeah, really. I mean, we are the guys who learn from our dads and our uncles and whatever and on the job and in the military mm -hmm. and not. But I mean, the younger generation, you know, uh, beyond us, they don't have that, well, That's also remember, give the immigrant populations in our communities a chance on this. You know, that, oh, that, that, yeah. that, you know, well, I think about here in Northern California, we've got a lot of, you know, immigrants who are very, very handy and very, very interested and motivated to learn how to repair. And I would say as the right to repair laws go into effect more and more, we're going to have to figure out how to empower people like that. To, we have to reconstitute third party paid repair. Basically, right. I think our jobs at these community repair events is to put ourselves out of business, to create mm -hmm. a world where we're not needed anymore, so that we can all move on to something else high value that society oh, needs. Yeah, yeah. Well, if nothing else, know. fixing our own yeah. stuff. I'm gonna, <laughs> as an example, That's you take true. Dan uh, in, in our gang here, and Dan started doing repair cafes when he was, what, what, 14 years old with his mom? Now he's got his own business, right, Dan? Just about, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I think it really the repair cafes, um, like the basis is not to teach you just that you can fix this or that, but that you can fix the things around you mm -hmm. more generally, you know, and not just material, you know, and we're because we're interacting with the community and, uh, you know, showing them that they can they can make a difference around them, you know, 
and yeah, the repair cafes go go further than just the the item. Yeah, you have a business card you can give out too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I you know I, I don't go there that. looking for work, but you know if yeah, someone we asks, always encourage you know, that. offer. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. I, I just want to, I just want to, I think we should probably wrap it up. I think there is a larger discussion here that we, we actually have all the time. There's a website called Hilo and I can drop that in the, in the follow-up notes, which is an organizer's um, discussion. And it happens a third Thursday drop in every, every month, but also again, I'll put a pitch in for the link to Peter Mewey's discord server, which is all about discussing from fixers. Um, but oh, it. yeah. it's not yeah. my server. It's no, our no, it, server. It's out exactly. Ah. He's just he spearheaded it exactly. But it's a really well known. It's a really, really you know you can get on it live from all over the world and you know fix. And there are sub ones like, mm. you know. So it's like I'm a jewelry fixer, but I could start a jewelry place. It's just a place to connect, and oh, you know. Cool. But I, yeah, I think you know this is um really appreciate everyone participating because I mean clearly. We're, we need to grow more fixers because I, I, we need to think about what our mandate is. I'm just getting so many requests. We have 60 cafes now. It was about 35 when I joined less than two years ago, uh, you know, as we came through COVID and obviously financial stuff is not doing well for people. So people are really motivated, you know, to save money. But, um, you know, we're just trying to figure this out. And it's it's um, I think ultimately we would love it to be tied into circular economy and businesses and putting all these people who want to go to work to work. I mean, that's sort of the larger uh, thing I think that we're going to get to. I, I um, but uh, yeah. So if anyone has any last thoughts or questions, I'm happy to um, entertain them, but then I think we should all uh, head out and just, I really appreciate everyone's time. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Fun. Fun. Yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Like all the repair cafes, it's about it's about community. So thank you guys. I will um, upload this to our YouTube channel and we'll send it around and and we'll really. Um, uh, don't forget about the book, the Repair Revolution book. Repair Revolution. I we I use that as my Bible oh, basically uh, for teaching people. Don't about forget. Cafes. Don't forget the NBC News Repair Cafe video that they yeah. shot at New Paltz which I use all the time to start yeah. new repair cafes because yes. you shoot that video to a town board meeting and they say, but I did that in Peekskill. It was like, we're doing it. Correct. It was and just I, like I, that. And what I do it largely, although I do all this stuff, is help repair cafe startup, ideally in our region, but I also do support volunteer efforts outside. So if anyone has any questions or whatever, feel free to reach out to me and to our group. And um, I just thank everyone for coming and, and really appreciate all the support. Thank you guys. Good talking. I have to catch up with all of these chat things. Okay.